Well, Jessica, now truly the floor is all yours. Great. Thank you so much um, for the nice introduction. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here today. I'm really honored to get to give you this talk. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions too. Um, so let me get the slides up. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, here we go. Yeah. So. Um, so uh, today um, I'm going to be talking about mental simulation, imagination, and model-based deep RL. So um, one of the things that motivates me is really this idea that humans are really the ultimate problem solvers. Um, we use imagination and creativity to find solutions to problems and even create new knowledge. Um, for example, we can use objects in very unconventional ways. For example, um, you know, what are sort of referred to as life hacks, like using a dustpan to help fill a bucket because the bucket doesn't fit in the sink. Um, we build machines that solve tasks for us, so um, both for fun and necessity. So on the fun side, you know, there's competitions like the first Lego League in which kids build these robots made out of Legos, and then um, you know they have to solve tasks and they compete to see who can solve whose robot can solve the most tasks. Um, on the necessity side, you know, we build so many machines all around us and have been doing so for millennia, um, hundreds of years, thousands of years. You know, machines like say water wheel, which helps us do things like you know remove the need to do manual annual labor um, for grinding grain or mining or these sorts of things. Um, and we perform thought experiments that allow us to also understand the world in new ways that we hadn't conceived of before. Um, so, you know, one of my favorites is uh, Newton's cannonball experiment, where the idea is imagine you had a cannonball and sitting on top of a really tall mountain and, you know, you shoot the cannon um, and the cannonball goes forward for a bit and then it falls down to earth and then you shoot it forward again at a, at a, you know, with a stronger force. It goes a little bit further, but again, falls back down to earth, but you keep shooting it with, you know, higher and higher forces and eventually it will start to circle around the earth. And so this intuition, you know, brings a uh, some new insights into you know how we conceive of gravity and orbital mechanics and these types of things, um, and so you know all of these sort of scenarios um, they have something in common, which is that they they engage this ability called mental simulation, which I think is summed up nicely in this famous quote by Kenneth Craig, which is that. If the organism carries a small scale model of external reality and of its own possible actions within its head, it is able to try out various alternatives, conclude which is the best of them, react to future situations before they arise, utilize the knowledge of past events in dealing with the present and the future, and in every way react in a much fuller, safer, and more competent manner to the emergencies which face it. Um, and so this ability for mental simulation has really long fascinated me. And one of the goals of my research is to understand how such an ability can help give rise to the types of creative problem solving I showed on the previous slide, and how we can build artificial agents with such creative and imaginative reasoning abilities. So over many decades of research, psychologists and neuroscientists have found evidence for mental simulation in a vast range of cognitive domains, ranging from relatively low level processes like motor control and spatial reasoning to very high level abilities like thought experiments and creativity. And I could really spend the whole talk just telling you about all of the places that mental simulation seems to occur. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the connection to AI too. So I'm just going to go through a few. Um, and in particular, if you look across all of these phenomena, a few themes tend to appear. Mental simulation is predictive, compositional, causal, incomplete, and adaptive. Um, and so I'm going to go through just one example from each of these themes to demonstrate a little bit more what I mean by them. So first, mental simulation is predictive. This means that mental simulations allow us to make predictions about what will happen in the future. For example, in some of my earlier work, we looked at how people reason about physical scenes like this tower of blocks on the left, um, asking them questions like, you know, will the tower fall over or what direction will it fall in? And we found that people use mental simulation to make these predictions, running forward a process of intuitive physical dynamics to predict how the blocks will move and then you know, ultimately come to the decision of will it fall or what direction. Second, mental simulation is compositional. It's not simply a black box predictor, but it's a process which is in some sense aware that things break down into parts or compose into larger wholes. Um, and one of my favorite examples of this um, is these experiments by Fink and Slayton in which they showed participants a simple set of shapes like this O, um, triangle, and the letter C, and then asked them to mentally simulate arranging those shapes to form an object that would be recognizable to others. And their participants come up with incredibly creative solutions. Um, for example, imagining manipulating these objects into something that maybe looks like an ice cream cone. 
But you actually don't even need cognitive science to tell you this, I think. The compositionality of human imagination is readily apparent in the art that we create, from our humbodos, man made out of vegetables, to the tangrams we play with as children, to pasta art. Um, and I think creating these sorts of things really wouldn't be possible if we weren't able to imagine or mentally simulate how pieces of the world fit together in different ways to form different things. Okay, third, mental simulation is incomplete, which means that even when it's supposed to operate over all of the details, it doesn't and it gets some wrong. Um, it strongly relies on prior experience to help inform its predictions. Um, and I think the early memory re researcher, Frederick Bartlett, describes this phenomenon well, where he says that remembering is not the re-excitation of fixed, lifeless, and fragmentary traces, it's an imaginative reconstruction. Um, and he goes on to say that it's hardly ever really exact, even in the most rudimentary cases of rote recapitulation, and it's not important that it should be. Um, and you can really see this exactly play out in, in the experiments that he ran, um, which are this type of iterated um, learning paradigm, in which he showed people drawings like this owl and asked them to reproduce it from memory. So the participant comes in, they stare at the owl for a while, then the owl is taken away and they have to draw it from memory. Um, and maybe they produce something that looks like this. And then the second participant comes in and they're asked to study the drawing from the first participant and then reproduce that. And so maybe they would then draw something that looks like this. And we can keep repeating this experiment over and over with each participant only getting to look at the drawing from the last participant and then reproduce it. And what you see is that over time, the errors accumulate and point towards people's prior expectations, which is to see something common like a house cat. Um, so what we're doing when we're remembering is we're, again, reconstructing um, both some stuff from our memory, but also from our prior experiences and sort of, you know, it's again, it's imaginative re reconstruction that doesn't capture everything, only things in broad strokes. Um, and I, I think there's another nice example here, which is that the same phenomenon was looked at on a larger scale by the company science.com, um, where they asked people to reproduce famous logos from memory. And uh, you see the same sort of thing, people get it right in broad strokes. They remember the color and the general layout, but they get the details wrong. For example, they forget whether the letter is in Ikea or blue or yellow, or they forget that the woman in the Starbucks logo is wearing a crown. Okay, fourth, mental simulation is causal, which is related to the notion that it's compositional. Um, but it, what it means is that we understand what would happen if certain aspects of a scene weren't present, or how things would change if we imagined something else to be there that isn't. Um, for example, Gerstenberg et al. showed people these scenes of bouncing balls and asked participants like, did A cause B to miss the goal? Um, and they tracked their eye movements, which you can see as the blue dot in the animation. And, and as you watch, what you'll be able to see is that um, the pattern of eye movements here show that people are paying attention to B and simulating what would happen if it didn't collide with A. So if it's simulating the case of if A were not present, what would happen to B? And from that simulation, they can then come up with a judgment of, did A cause B to miss the goal? In which case, yes, because if A weren't there, it would have gone in. Okay, finally, mental simulation is adaptive. We choose adaptively how many simulations to run before making a decision. Um, for example, in some of the work that I did during my PhD, I looked at how many simulations people run when making predictions about whether a ball will go through a hole, as in the video on the left. And what we find overall is that people run very few simulations, averaging just between, say, two and four simulations per decision, and that this number is chosen adaptively depending on the difficulty of the task. So hopefully these examples give some intuition as to what I mean when I say that mental simulation is predictive, compositional, incomplete, causal, and adaptive. And I'll keep coming back to some of these ideas in the remainder of the talk. So that's a brief overview of what mental simulation looks like in humans. Um, and so for the rest of the talk, I wanna discuss how we can take steps towards developing algorithms, which effectively make use of this type of mental simulation. So first I'm gonna discuss analogs of mental simulation and current deep learning approaches. And then I'll discuss some of the limitations of these approaches with a particular emphasis on generalization. And finally, I want to talk about a project which offers a way, I think, to address some of these limitations. So given that mental simulation is such an important part of human cognition, we might think that AI systems should have a similar capacity. So next, I'll talk about analogs of mental simulation and deep learning, specifically in the case of DeepRL. <laughs> 
Um, so reinforcement learning is the problem of learning how to act in the world in order to maximize a reward signal. And typically this is formulated as follows. So there's an agent in an environment which produces observations, for example, visual stimuli, you know, what the world looks like. The agent can then take actions, for example, by executing a motor control, which then affects the environment. And the environment then produces more observations along with a reward signal that tells the agent how well it's doing. And so again, the goal of the agent is to take actions which maximize this reward. And the main framework that's used in reinforcement learning is called the MDP or Markov decision process, or it's partially observed variance, the POMDP for partially observed Markov decision process. And the POMDP governs the relationship between states of the world, um, S, observations of the world, O, actions that affect the state of the world, A, and rewards, R. These relationships are given by particular functions which relate these variables. For example, the transition function takes in states and actions and produces new states. So that's saying if I'm in state S sub T and I take action A sub T, what will uh, state S T plus one be? Similarly, the reward function says, what rewards do you get from being in a particular st state and taking a particular action? Um, the observation and recognition function relate how observations are related to the states. And the policy, uh, which is sort of the primary function in reinforcement learning, states um, what action should I take from a given state. So in Model Free RL, which is the majority of reinforcement learning, we're concerned with directly learning a policy that goes from states to actions. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, deep reinforce or deep learning in general, um, for example, um, many of the standard approaches are say, you know, in object recognition tasks, like you take in an image and you have to predict, does this have a cat or a dog? Um, we can do something very similar for learning models and policies in the context of reinforcement learning as well. Um, so for example, here you can see the DQN neural network architecture, which my colleagues at DeepMind trained to play Atari games like Breakout, which you can see on the right. Um, you can see that this um, sort of idea fits the, the same types of neural networks we can train in the object classification case, um, where you have an input, which is the um, observation of the game. You do some processing with a bunch of neural network layers, and you output an action, for example, say, move the joystick up. Um, and notice again how this fits the little schematic I showed before. Here, the agent gets an observation of the state. It does some computation with the policy and then outputs the action. OK, so that's model-free RL. In contrast, model-based RL, we are interested in learning transition, reward, and recognition functions from which we can then compute a policy. And this process of going from a set of models to a policy is known as planning. Model-based RL has been very successful in solving a range of very difficult tasks, including board games like Go. So if you've, if you've heard of AlphaGo, um, that uses a model-based approach. Um, robotic manipulation, for example, um, in the visual foresight model, which allows an agent to imagine what it will see in the future in order to say, like, pick up an object and successfully bring it to a target location, like on this plate. Um, or embodied navigation, as in the dreamer agent, which again imagines, you know, what would it see if it takes particular actions? and, and it allows us to sort of dream up hypothetical scenarios to learn from in order to navigate around this maze and pick up these apples. So the majority of research in model-based deep RL can be split into two categories, research that focuses on learning models like the transition function and research that focuses on planning. A useful observation is that we can actually model many forms of mental simulation itself through the POMDP framework, making it clear that the computations being performed in a mental simulation are closely related to model-based RL. For example, we can view the prediction of whether a tower of blocks will fall over as a forward rollout of the transition model in the POMDP. And we can also see mental rotation as a planning process going from the transition function of how the object rotates to an actual sequence of actions like rotate by 20 degrees, rotate by 10 degrees, etc. So if mental simulation can be viewed as a POMDP and model-based RL gives us a set of tools for solving POMDPs, do we have agents that can use mental simulation in a way that's similar to humans? Um, I would say the answer is not quite. Um, and the sort of uh, underlies my current research program. Um, and so if we return to the list of themes of mental simulation that I discussed earlier, we can see where the gaps are. So I would see, say that we have the first one down pretty well. Transition and reward models are inherently predictive. They predict what will happen or what reward I'm going to get. So it's safe to say that model-based RL is itself predictive as well. 
but I would say it's not terribly compositional. The models that we use are usually pretty black box. For example, um, they don't easily encode structure like the relations between objects or the number of objects or these sorts of things. Um, they also don't really capture the notion of incompleteness. For example, many approaches re require reconstructing the full observation, which means being able to predict you know, exactly what each pixel value is going to be, as opposed to predicting things in broad strokes. And while transition models do have some notion of causality in that they can predict the outcomes of different actions, they usually lack the capacity to represent entirely different realities, such as what if a particular object weren't there? And finally, planning algorithms aren't very adaptive. They usually use large fixed size budgets to compute a policy or action. And so there's lots of work to be done on all of these dimensions, and I've been exploring some of them. Um, but today I want to focus just on one of them, which is compositionality. Um, and as I said, other approach, existing approaches tend to fail to generalize. Um, and so what I want to talk about first is what it means to fail to generalize, um, sort of why these methods are failing, um, and then proposing a solution to it. Um, and so this project that I'll talk about is actually some of my most recent work, which um, was just accepted to iClear, we'll be presenting later this spring, um, and is joint work with a bunch of uh, my wonderful colleagues, and in particular, Taya Weber and Abe Friesen. So um, in this work, we were interested in investigating the role of planning in model-based reinforcement learning. Um, so if you recall, I mentioned that model-based RL breaks down into two components, learning the model and then using it in planning. But there's many possible choices in the space of planning algorithms, and we wanted to disentangle the effects of some of these choices. For example, um, how much planning is necessary to learn a good policy? Like how many simulations do you need to run? Or how far forward in the future should we actually have the agent imagine? Um, and most relevantly for this talk, to what extent does planning help with generalizing to new scenarios? And we focused our analysis on uh, MuZero, which is a recent model-based system that achieved state-of-the-art performance on various domains ranging from um, Go to Atari. And it was originally released in 2019, and there's a more recent um, paper that I, I believe was published in Nature um, earlier this year. Um, so you can check out the details if you're curious about that. Um, so just as a high-level overview, here's how MuZero works. Um, so at first, before as in the standard RL loop that I showed you before, the agent gets observations from the world. And then it uses its model of the world to plan what is the best action to take from the current scenario. And the particular form of planning that MuZero uses is what's known as Monte Carlo Tree Search or MCTS. And at a high level, MCTS works by the agent imagining future possible states it could be in, um, and then which actions might be good to take from that state. And importantly, it, it uses a learned policy to help guide the search for the best action, as well as what is known as a value function, which estimates how good each imagined state is to be in. Um, so you can think of the policy as sort of like an educated guess. The agent imagines the best action that the policy recommends, and then estimates how good the action actually is with the value function. Then it can try the second best action, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I have here just this little schematic saying, you know, you can think of the policy as effectively deciding you know, it's a guess of like, where should I search? The model is saying, what will happen if I search there? And the value function is saying, is it good what actually does happen? So after planning, the agent chooses um, the best action that it came up with, or maybe it, it samples from, you know, a distribution over actions. Um, and then that action is sent to the world. Um, and then, you know, the, the world gives it new observations and so on. That's the typical RL loop again as before. Um, one thing that MuZero also does is it uses the results of its, of its planning process to improve the policy and value function. And you can think of this as a little bit like a bootstrapping procedure. The search improves on the policy and value function and then uses the improved policy and value function to update its neural network. So if you think of it like this, where you know, we have the policy and value function here, then the search brings us a little bit better here, and then we like update the old policy and value function to be here, and then again, we perform a search, update it, and so on. And so we get better and better a little bit over time. So, um, okay, that's just a very quick overview of how MuZero works. So to be able to draw generalizable conclusions about the role of planning in model-based RL, we tested MuZero across a wide range of tasks that varied in their branching factor, time horizon, sparsity of rewards, and variability of initial conditions. Um, and so these are the environments that we tested here. We have a few. Um, these are uh, 
the first three are what are called continuous control tasks. Um, for example, you have to control a character to say, you know, run forward or stand up. Um, we have sort of more game type tasks like mini Pac-Man and two, Atar uh, two Atari games, Hero and Ms. Pac-Man. So um, uh, in mini Pac-Man, the idea is you're controlling the little green pixel and you have to run around and pick up all the blue pixels while avoiding the red one. Um, and Hero, it's sort of, you know, you just have to run around in these rooms and, and um, find survivors that are trapped. Um, and in Ms. Pac-Man is a kind of, you know, classic game, more complicated than mini Pac-Man, sort of the real version of it. And we have these strategy games as well, like Sokoban, which involves um, running around and pushing these boxes onto targets, um, and 9 by 9 Go, which is a simpler version of the full game of Go. OK, so first we looked at how much the agent can improve its performance by using more search at decision time, or in other words, running more simulations with Monte Carlo tree search. Um, so here um, on the x-axis, um, what I'm showing you here is after the agent has been trained, um, if you ask it to try to do the task, for example, in Acrobat, Cheetah, et cetera, um, using different numbers of simulation to plan its actions, how well does it do? And so one on the y-axis corresponds to sort of you know, regular performance. Um, greater than one indicates that it's, it's improving as a result of using more simulations. And less than one indicates that it's decreasing in performance. Um, and so what you'll notice is that surprisingly, we find almost no improvement. Um, e even using large amounts of search in most domains. So, you know, you see a little improvement in, say, Sokoban. Um, Acrobat does benefit from, from some improvement here as well. But the other ones don't, you really don't see much improvement at all. And in some cases, you actually see a decrease in performance after many simulations. So we might explain this by saying, well, the model that MuZero has learned is imperfect. So, you know, it has errors. And if we do a lot of simulations, then we will encounter those errors. And, and so that'll sort of throw the agent off course, right? So we can redo this experiment, but give it a perfect model of the world instead. So every simulation that it runs, you know, if, if you're if it's in a particular state and it says, okay, what if I were to take this action? It will always get a correct prediction of what the next state is. But what we find is that the results largely hold. Even with a perfect model, we see only small benefits of more planning at test time. Um, the, the sort of one outlier here that you'll notice is Ms. Pac-Man, which does get a lot better um, with more simulations, but this is actually is due to the fact that um, Ms. Pac-Man, the simulator, gives the agent sort of information that it wouldn't otherwise know about. Um, in particular, um, you know, if it eats a power pill, then the ghosts will become edible, and then after some point in time, they'll change back to being non-edible and being dangerous. Um, and the agent doesn't know when that will happen, but the simulator, when it has access to that, it'll tell it. And so it normally wouldn't have that information, but here it gets it and it can exploit it. But in all the other games where it doesn't sort of have this sort of thing that it can exploit, we find basically the same results. Um, and this is surprising. We have a perfect model. How can it not help us if we do more simulations? And so what we hypothesized is that other learned components besides the model, such as the policy or the value function, might be affecting their performance. Jessica, so, there are a yes. couple of the questions. I think they could be answered already. One question is that the 10 MCTS that you have used, can it be applied in the task using continuous state and action spaces? Uh, yes, great question. So there's, um, there's, I guess, two answers to that. So the first one is that in these experiments, we discretized the continuous state or um, sorry, we just discretized the continuous action space. Um, and uh, you can, that actually works pretty well, even in relatively high dimensional applications, like in the humanoid has, um, uh, I'm forgetting the exact number, but I think it's 37 degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and what you do is basically you treat each action as independent. Um, and so it sort of takes 37 actions simultaneously. And so it can't reason about the correlation between the actions, but in practice that it seems to work okay. Um, there are also mm -hmm. other approaches that people have proposed where you can use MCTS directly in the continuous action space. And um, those also can work well though, um, just for consistency, because it requires sort of implementing a different version of the mm -hmm. search, we, we used discretization here. Yeah, good question. And then another question is that the, the categorization you used, the so control games and strategy, was there any particular criteria you used to categorize them into these three categories? Um, 
just just in terms of um, sort of like qualitative differences. So, I mean, these the acrobat cheetah and humanoid are continuous control, meaning the action space is continuous. And the idea is you want to mm -hmm. control like the joints and, and so on. Um, and, and, you know, Hero and Ms. Pac-Man are the you know traditional video games they have mm -hmm. relatively like long horizons and then mini pac-man is kind of just a simpler version of ms pac-man um, and then both sokoban and nine by nine go are games that have traditionally thought to require sort of deeper or more complex reasoning like so sokoban for example is one where there's a lot of dead ends so if you push the box into um, the wrong location, like in a corner, then you can never get it out again. You can never pull the boxes down so you can get stuck really easily. And so, you know, the thinking mm -hmm. goes, well, you have to really think ahead. What do you want to do in order to solve the task and not get stuck? Um, and similarly with Go is sort of, I guess, the, the pinnacle mm -hmm. of what's been thought to sort of require long term strategic thinking. So mm -hmm. that that that's sort of qualitatively how we picked these. Gotcha. Yeah. So that actually brings up my question is that the, but I don't see Go in those plots that you have just shown us because I do see that the Sokoban is there, but the are the curves for oh, the yeah, Go Oh yeah, that's mission? actually, that is true. Uh -huh. um, so it, that's a great um, question and a great point. And I totally missed this when I was making my slides. So we did some of our experiments. So these experiments mm -hmm. actually we didn't um, do on Go, um, but we mm -hmm. have other experiments in the paper which we did do on Go. Um, okay. And okay. so I, I probably should have excluded Go from the this environment slide here. Um, the Go experiments are actually very interesting, but I'm not going to talk about them today. <laughs> um, so okay. you can ignore that, that yes. one for now. Sorry uh -huh. about that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Great. So, right. Um, so, okay. So, right. So just, just to recap. Um, so we didn't find much improvement from using planning at test time. Um, but we did hypothesize that other components, maybe the policy or value function might be affecting the performance. So to test this, we combined the learned value functions with the perfect environment simulator in a different type of planner. Um, called breadth first search or BFS. And unlike Monte Carlo tree search, breadth first search doesn't use a policy prior to guide its search. It just tries all actions, um, but it still evaluates them with the value function. Um, so in this case, you can think that because we're using the simulator and because we don't need a policy prior, the only component that matters here is the value function. And what we find is that any amount of planning with breadth first search hurts performance. Um, which really confirms the hypothesis that it's the value function that's failing to generalize in states that it hasn't seen during training. Um, and this is, you know, these are um, these are states that it could have conceivably seen a lot during training. It just didn't, um, because this is, these are exactly the same tasks that we trained it on, and now we're looking at it at test time. Um, so, in other words, like even in a single task setting errors in the model of the world aren't the only types of errors we need to care about. If we want planning to be effective, we need the value functions and the policy priors, which we didn't explore in this experiment explicitly, but we need both of those things to generalize as well. Um, and, and we did some further experiments that really, I think, drive this point home even further. Um, so again, as I said, the last few slides, we were only looking at the effect of using more planning at test time for the same environment seen during training. But we can also test generalization to new environments. Um, so to do this, we trained Mu0 on a finite collection of randomly generated mini Pac-Man levels. Um, so again, the goal in mini Pac-Man is to control the green dot to go around and pick up all of the blue dots and avoid the red dot. Um, and so we train it on some number of scenes that look like the ones in the on the train with the train label. So we can train it on either five, 10, or 100 of those randomly generated maps. And then we test it um, using this handcrafted test scene on the right. Um, and so uh, in the plots that I'll show, look the same is kind of the same thing I was showing you before. On the x-axis is the amount of planning that we're doing at test time. And on the y-axis is how good we're doing, with one corresponding to perfect generalization. And what we find is that with a learned model, increasing planning at test time only weakly improves performance, similar to what we found before, and eventually sort of catastrophically degrades it. Um, so, you know, you see a little bit of improvement with planning if you trained on a lot of different scenes, um, uh, but up to about, say, 25 simulations. But after that, everything crashes and burns. Um, and even with a simulator, surprisingly, Planning helps more, especially if you have fewer training scenes, but too much planning can hurt. And you never get to this 
point of having perfect generalization, even after thousands of simulations, which is surprising. We really thought that, you know, given that amount of computation, you would sort of be exhaustively doing search and you would eventually get perfect generalization. But the reason that you don't is the same reason as what we found with these experiments with breadth first search, that planning really depends on these other components like the policy and the value function. And so even if you have a perfect model of the world, it doesn't guarantee having good generalization performance. And so um, the key takeaway here is that effective planning really requires having good representations for the policy, the value function, and the model. So you need to be able to make good decisions in any state you might encounter of where to search, what will happen, and is what will happen good. I see. Okay. So yeah. one, there is a one question that I'm going to combine with my own question uh, mm -hmm. is that the, so there is a model and simulation. And then I think the, a lot of people are being a bit confused by the difference between the model and simulator. And also when there is the zero simulations, I guess that corresponds to simply using policy on its yes. own, just taking the arguments. Okay, gotcha. Exactly. Can you yeah. actually clarify the difference between these three cases just once more for the audience? Yeah, so the, um, yeah, so the model corresponds to the model that the agent has learned. Um, so it's, it's what the agent thinks will happen if it takes a particular action in a particular state. The simulator, I guess I should, um, maybe I should have picked a different term for that actually, but that's kind of, that's like, that's using the environment itself as the model. So it's it's as if, so you can think of the main difference is basically just being able to try multiple actions from the same state. So in the real world, right, like you take an action and then that transitions you to the next state. You can never undo the action that you just did. You sort of have to keep going forward in time. Um, whereas <clears throat> when you're using the environment as the model in these planning process, you can say, oh, what would happen if I go right? What would happen if I go left? What would happen if I go forward? And you can try all of those different actions if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, using zero simulations at test time corresponds to just using the policy prior. So rather than doing search, you just sort of rely on that as your default guess of what to do. I see. So uh, perhaps one question I can ask here further is that the how does those uh, performance compare to model-free policy gradient algorithm? Yes. Is oh, yeah. I, I, meant to, I meant to mention this. Yeah. So <laughs> all of the results that we get here on these um, environments are comparable to the state of the art results in um, on those environments in general. So um, mm -hmm. they're like comparable to either mo the best model free or the best model based approach that you can get. Yeah. I see. I see. So I wonder, you know, if, the, if your results could be interpreted in a way that is slightly different. So in some sense, the policy was trained really, really well with this model-based learning algorithm, but ultimately after training, it looks like we can throw away the learned model and just use the policy because the zero simulation looked pretty good already, right? Well, it depends on the scenario. So let me, I guess, mm -hmm. um, yes. let me uh, make this bigger. Um, okay. So um, <laughs> here you can see, so mm -hmm. it, it, I think it's true if you're working in a single task setting, um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like, so if we come here, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, zero simulations is just, you might as well just throw away the model and do what you said, right. you just rely on the policy prior. But one of the mm -hmm. sort of, you know, justifications for why we might want to use mental simulation is because it allows us to anticipate what will happen in situations that we haven't seen before. And so that's mm -hmm. like these experiments in, in this case, you, the agent has never seen this map before. Um, and um, if, if it has trained enough, say if it's seen like a lot of diversity in the training scenes, a hundred different training scenes, then it's okay. Um, but if it hasn't seen a lot of things before, then it, its policy prior is actually not that good, right? Um, which mm. is these points right here. And again, if you have a perfect model, it does help you improve. So this mm -hmm. is sort of, it's both a positive and a negative result for generalization. It's showing if you have a really good model of the world, you can generalize to some extent, but you still can never make it up to perfect generalization because of the limitation of the policy prior and the value function. Um, so I would say absolutely yes. If you're like in a single task setting and everything is like you've seen before, you, you've distilled all of your all of the important experience already into your policy and you can just use that. But if you need to do something new, then that's you know, that's mm -hmm. sort of like the thing that we don't know how quite how to deal with yet. And we would hope that you know, model-based RL would sort of help us in that scenario. And what our results show is it'll only help us to the extent that we have good representations for policies, values, and models.
I see. So I mean, there's one more question, which is quite long, but I'm going to shorten it so that we can actually move on to the next one after you yeah. answer this. So essentially, the idea here is that the how do you tell the uh, distinguish whether you know it is the policy and value functions being trained together, or you know, it's, it, you know, it's the policy alone or the value alone. So how how can we actually assign the credit to the policy and value, and as well as a simulator in studying you know, what are the components that impact the generalization performance most. So for instance, if somebody gave us a perfect value function and then just train a policy function and then test the generalization, will we see something different from tuning both of them together? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I think, so, okay, so if we had a, I think the, um, probably the biggest, component or the most important component my guess would be the value function because what you, what you can sort of see the value function is is it's like a surrogate reward function so if you like you know you try an action and then you see if it's good or not and so even if your policy prior is sort of recommending like really bad things to try mm -hmm. if you had a perfect value function as long as all actions under your policy prior had positive po probability then you would eventually mm -hmm. with enough computation you would sort of make up for that difference um, but with a bad value function, um, then, I mean, I guess the opposite is true too. I mean, if you had a perfect policy, you wouldn't need to do search at all, um, mm. right? Um, so it's, I mean, it's it's interesting, but I think, I guess like the, the issue is that maybe we can't hope to have a perfect policy in all settings because we're always gonna be encountering new settings. Mm -hmm. And right. we, I mean, I guess we also can't hope to have a perfect value function either, but I think what we want to be able to do is have value functions and policies which are maybe complementary to each other and at least sort of point mm -hmm. us in the right direction. Whereas I think the, the issue is like the types of errors that we see in them now are really just like, if in states that we haven't encountered before, say like in my search, I'm like, oh, what what if I take this action? But it's actually not, you know, that's really outside the the training set and it's really far from, you know, my ability to make a good mm -hmm. prediction. Maybe as humans, we are we have an understanding of that uncertainty, but the agent doesn't. And so it'll, you know, if it's if its value function says, oh yeah, that's a great action to take, then it will believe mm -hmm. it and it'll say, oh yeah, that we should do that, even though maybe it's actually a, a catastrophic catastrophically bad thing to do so so yeah it's a, like a little bit of a catch-22 right like if we gave it a perfect value mm -hmm. function or if we gave it a perfect policy then you know maybe it we're sort of back to this point where maybe we don't actually need to do like that much planning but um mm -hmm. yeah so but I, I think um it would be interesting though to try to disentangle like those approaches a mm -hmm. little bit more like which one is better i think we did some additional experiments which weren't in the paper, um, it, partially we didn't put it in because it, the results were kind of hard to interpret, but the mm -hmm. the rough idea was that um, the it seemed like the policy was probably better than the value function, that the, the oh, more of the errors were, were in the value function itself, which is why you mm -hmm. see like, you know, if you rely on the value function, you get this sort of behavior. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas if you rely just on the policy, you know, that's like, mm -hmm that's zero simulations. That's reasonably right. good. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry, that was a, sort of answering a couple of questions in, in one, I think, but, um, hopefully that uh, no, it is, it's yeah. a great insight. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I think that we can continue. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, right. So, okay. So we need good representations for all of these things. So what do good representations look like? Um, so the rest of the talk, um, I'm going to give one proposal for this um, towards building more compositional representations in DeepRL that we might be able to use not just for models of the world, but also for policies and value functions too. Um, and this is work uh, that was led by my colleagues, Victor Best and Alvaro Sanchez Gonzalez. And again, was also a collaboration with a number of other great people. So um, in this project, we were interested in developing agents that could solve challenging compositional tasks like stacking blocks to achieve a goal. Um, and to this end, we designed a series of tasks in which the agency is a scene that looks like this with a set of blue blocks below the floor and some number of red obstacles above the floor. And the agent's job is to then pick up the blocks and place them in the scene, avoiding the obstacles as it does so. And the agent can choose to make the blocks sticky, um, which, will, oops, which will cause them to stick to any other blocks that they come in contact with. So how should an agent interact with these sort of block stacking environments? 
Well, a common choice of action space um, in sort of standard deep RL settings would be to have the agent take absolute actions like, you know, place block D at position 7.2 comma 8.5. Um, but if we as humans were talking about acting in these sorts of environments, we would never say something so precise as that. We would say something more along the lines of place block D on the top left of block B. So to implement this type of action, we can, of course, have the agent directly choose which object it wants to move, which one it should place relatively to, and you know what this offset location should be. And intuitively, you can think of it as a little bit like placing a Lego brick. You pick up a Lego to stack, you put a, a base Lego to put it on top of, and then you pick the dimple location where the top Lego should be placed. But it's not obvious how to actually implement this type of action format in an RL agent because most agent architectures assume a fixed size action space. Um, but here, since we're defining the actions based on the objects in the scene, the number of actions will change as the number of objects changes. Um, and in particular, if you were allowed to pick up any object in the scene, you would have n squared actions, right? You could pick up any object and put it on any other object. So um, to deal with this problem, we designed a new type of agent that we call GNDQN um, for graph network DQN, uh, which operates over graphs. And specifically how this works is we have the uh, representation of the scene. So that's like a collection of objects and say their positions, their orientations, their sizes, their shapes, colors, so on and so forth. And we convert this to a graph structured observation where the graph has nodes corresponding to the objects in the scene. And again, those nodes have attributes corresponding to the object attributes like position, size, and so on. And then there's edges between different objects in the scene. <clears throat> so given this graph structured representation, uh, we now need a neural network that can process it. Um, and so for that, we can use what's known as a graph neural network, uh, which is a type of neural network that's become very popular in the last few years that can process graphs. Um, and graph neural networks have a few important features, which are that they take graphs in as input and they return graphs as output. So this is a little bit different from your sort of standard deep learning approach where you might take in, say, an image as input and give out you know, a vector of features or a tensor of features. Here we have a graph where a graph is defined as a set of edges nodes and maybe some global properties that apply to everything in the graph. And so the graph network takes in this set of nodes, edges, and globals and processes it and returns a new set of nodes, edges, and globals. Um, and as a result of sort of taking in these sets of nodes, edges, and globals, the graph neural networks become in invariant to the permutation of the nodes and edges. So it doesn't matter you know, what order you give the objects it say, for example, um, it'll still be able to process all of them in the same way, and it'll give you exactly the same answer. And another consequence of using graph neural networks are that they scale to different numbers of nodes and edges. So again, because they take in a collection of nodes, a collection of edges, and a collection of globals, um, they can process any number of them. They don't have to be a fixed size. Um, and this is particularly relevant to this problem that we're dealing with because we have different numbers of objects depending on how many blocks are placed in the scene. Um, and so representing those um, scenes as graphs and processing them with graph neural networks, we don't have to worry about the number of objects. It can always just process it. So we have our graph representation. We pass it through a graph neural network. And we ask the graph neural network to produce a new representation of the graph that has activations on the edges of this graph. And these activations we will take to correspond to the actions that the agent should take. So for example, if we have an activation here on the edge from block D to block B, we might interpret this as place block D on block B, and then the specific location of the activation along the edge corresponds to the offset of where we will place that block. So again, place block D on block B on its top left, and Again, you can think of the Lego analogy where um, you know, one node on the edge corresponds to the block you pick up, another node on the edge corresponds to the block where you place it, and the specific location corresponds to the dimple. So to test this sort of agent, we developed several separate objectives. In the silhouette task, the goal of the agent is to place blocks to match these green silhouettes. And here is an example solution to the task um, where you can see that some of the blocks are teal, indicating that they've been made sticky, and the gray dots in between the blocks indicate where they're sticking together. Um, and here the agent gets a reward of plus one um, for every target that it manages to match and minus 0.5 for every block it makes sticky. In the connecting task, the goal is to stack blocks to connect the floor to these targets in the sky. 
And this task is more challenging because the final structure is underspecified. It requires the agent to design a solution. Um, and again, you can see here a solution to the task where it's sort of stacking the blocks, weaving in between um, these different obstacles. And in our most difficult task, covering, the agent's goal is to cover these obstacles from above. Um, and you can think of this as requiring the agent to build shelters from the rain. If the obstacles are covered, then they should stay dry in the rain. And again, this is even more difficult because as before, the solution is underspecified, but as well, we make the sticky blocks really expensive. So the agent really has to reason about um, the physical stability of the structures that it's building. So we compared this graph network agent with many other conventional types of agents, including um, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and so on. Um, and across the board, we found them to do a lot worse in all of the construction tasks that we created. Um, so here in, in this graph, you can see a comparison between sort of the best agent that uses an unstructured representation, so not a graph, um, compared to the structured agent, the GraphNet um, DQN agent. Um, and in all of these tasks, we find the GraphNet agent to do much, much better. Um, these Plots are all well and good, but I think the, the comparisons in terms of videos are really compelling. So I'm gonna show you a few of those. So here's the silhouette task um, where you can see again on the left is the best unstructured agent that uses a recurrent neural network. Um, and on the right is a structured agent which uses this graph neural network. And what you can see is the uh, unstructured agent sort of really struggles to place the objects in exactly the right position. It also has a hard time reasoning about, you know, uh, colliding objects with each other and put, maybe even sometimes putting objects inside each other. It doesn't always reason quite right about how to make blocks sticky and so on. Um, and in contrast, the graph neural network agent um, is doing a very good job. It does a great job of reasoning about glue. It makes a few mistakes here and there, but by and large, it's doing, you know, almost ceiling level performance on this task. So Jessica, um, there is one quick question uh, on the ask a question section is that the, is the structured representation generated manually or automatically and does the unstructured agent what what does it actually look at does it look at a graph or the pixel level representation so we looked at both so the recurrent neural network um so the the yeah so the um representation that the graph neural network gets is um, an object level representation. So it's not getting, you know, pixels. We're sort of telling it where mm -hmm. each object is though. In these scenes, the segmentation task is like, very straightforward. Um, so I don't think it's really making a huge um, assumption there. And we actually did do some experiments too, where we um, uh, gave it like we gave it a pixel level representation plus segmentation masks, and it's able to basically reach the same level of performance. Um, uh, the uh, the unstructured agents, um, we tried both giving them pixel and object level representations. So um, out of the agents that we tried, the RNN agents got object level representations and just sort of processed them in an arbitrary order. Um, the convolutional neural networks got images. Um, so it's a, like a little bit of a you know, they're using different representations, but obviously convolutional neural networks are best suited to images. So we wanted, we basically, out of these, all of these things that I'm showing, we picked the agent that did best, regardless of the representation that it used. Um, so I think in silhouette is the best one was the object level RNN. And in covering, as I'll show you the video in a moment, the best mm -hmm. one was the CNN, but you'll see in all of the, all of these cases, the, it, it still doesn't work that well, <laughs> so. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. thanks. Okay, so let me show you the connecting video. Okay, so um, yeah, so again, on the left is the best unstructured agent. Um, again, this is an RNN, on, and on the right is the graph network agent. And um, you can see the RNN agent has sort of learned this somewhat degenerate strategy of trying to stock stack the blocks up on either side of the scene and then reach them in towards the middle to reach the targets, um, which can work okay in some scenes, but doesn't work that well if, if the targets are really close to the center and far away from the edges. Um, and in contrast, the graph neural network agent has learned how to stack the blocks up to weave in and out between the obstacles, and again, is solving most of the scenes. And then finally, in the, in the covering task, we see a similar pattern of behavior, the best unstructured agent, which in this case is a CNN instead, um, rather than an RNN. Um, this has a similar strategy of stacking the blocks up on either side and then reaching them in towards the middle to try to cover the obstacles from above, um, which again can work okay in some cases, um, but in if the objects or if the obstacles are too far apart, again, it fails. Um, and in comparison, the graph neural network agent has learned this really interesting strategy of stacking up 
the blocks in making these sort of T or umbrella structures. And then in some cases, even composing them into larger structures like arches and so on. Okay, so, um, so, so far I've just been talking about a model free agent. Um, it just has this particular type of structured representation that allows it to um, you know, be able to solve these tasks in a pr um, fairly sophisticated manner. Um, but we can use these types of compositional and structured representations in model-based RL too, because, you know, as I was saying in the previous section, what we need are better representations for things like policies and value functions, as well as models. And so in this case, we allowed the agent to have access to a perfect model of the world, but we, we um, did search using these structured um, val uh, Q functions, which is another form of value function. Um, so it's, it's similar to how mu0 works, but it, it's a slightly different type of um, function that it's using, it does, so it doesn't have a policy in the same way. Um, and so we can test how well this model-based version of this agent works too, particularly in the context of generalization. Um, so we had a few different generalization experiments um, in, for example, the silhouette and in the connecting tasks. Um, and in these generalization experiments, what we did is we, we trained the agent on one type of scene, and then we asked it to generalize either to larger scenes or, or different variety of scenes. Um, so specifically in the silhouette, case, we trained it on scenes that had up to eight targets that it had to match. And then at test time, we tested it on scenes with up to 16 targets, so twice as many as seen during training. Um, in the connection task, we had two variations of the generalization experiment. So one was um, that during training, it always saw the target um, locations at the same um, Y coordinate, so they were all always at the same level. And then at test time, we asked it to um, try to match targets which were at different Y levels. Um, or we asked it to try to stack, um, to reach targets that were higher up in the air and had to go past one more additional layer of obstacles. Um, and you can see in all of these cases that both the original model free agent and the one that uses planning that's in orange and purple are able to generalize really quite well in these scenarios. In, in the silhouette case, the reward actually goes a lot up because there's twice as many objects. And so it's able to match twice as many objects. And so the reward almost doubles. Um, and that's in contrast to say the RNN agent, which um, really can't generalize at all. It actually gets worse performance when you increase the number of objects. Um, and so again, you can see qualitatively what this looks like here. Um, this is the model-based agent using these structured representations to guide its search and ultimately solve scenes that are twice as large as what it's seen during training. Uh, Jessica, there are there are a couple of questions. One is that the is have you been able to see whether the strategies learned by, for instance, this graph network uh, DQN or the graph network MCTS is more similar to the human like strategy or while you know, let's say RNN or the just a convolutional network one look quite different? Were you able um, to see anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we haven't tested humans in these settings specifically. Um, I actually think these tasks would be kind of hard for humans to do because they require a lot of precision and where you place the objects. And so say if you accidentally have an object which is like slightly overlapping another object, it'll cause the episode to end. Um, and I think humans would really struggle with that. Um, but that's actually mm -hmm. something that's you know relatively easy for the agents to learn. So I, I, don't, see, think, I don't think you could compare mm -hmm. them one to one, um, mm -hmm. but I and I think that you would probably see a greater diversity of strategies in humans if if you were able to adapt the mm -hmm. task to make it a little bit more human friendly. I think mm -hmm. you know what we see in like the covering task with it building these like T structures. You probably mm -hmm. would see that humans do that, but you would probably see them do other types of structures too. And so um, I think it would mm -hmm. be really interesting to do a comparison, but we didn't do that specifically here. Mm -hmm. I think there is a bit of a confusion about you know, the, how the graph is generated and then what it actually encodes. Does the, let's say the connectivity pattern encodes the relative locations of the objects or is the objects locations given as a actual coordinate feature of each of the node? Can you clarify it for us? Yeah, good question. So the, um, the object locations are given as a feature of the nodes and then the graph itself is actually a fully connected graph. So every node is connected to every other node. And we did explore, um, it's not in the paper, but we explored using um, sort of manually constructed connectivity of the graph and we found that worked worse. So we just 
used mm. the fully connected graph. Um, but uh, I think you you probably could imagine trying to automatically learn what is like the right connectivity um, to like maybe using mm -hmm. some form of attention, something that looks maybe a little bit more like a transformer um, would mm -hmm. be interesting to explore. All right. And then the one final question we have for now is that uh, whether you have considered the generalized problem where the each of the block has its own cost. So you know, moving a larger block is you know more costly and not one that. Yeah, um, we actually, that's a great question. We did talk about that. Um, we never actually did experiments with that. Um, I, mm -hmm. We sort of like, the, we found that the sticky penalty for the blocks was kind of an interesting enough um, modulator mm -hmm. of like task difficulty. Um, but uh, yeah, we did talk about that. And I think it would be very straightforward to incorporate into this to say like, oh, the, you know, the larger blocks cost more because it's more building material or whatever. And it, I think that mm -hmm. really would change the strategy. I mean, maybe not so much in the silhouette task, but certainly in the covering task, um, you would probably see it, you know, it would need to really make extra good use of the long blocks and probably I guess it depends on the specifically what the costs were, right? But maybe you would find it building things more like two towers and then one block on top rather than, you know, one tower here with an umbrella and another tower here with an umbrella. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, it would be interesting to explore. And we, we talked about it, but never actually did it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I, I'm just about done. I have just one more result to show, um, which is that, um, so we can actually get these results to also improve further if we use even more sophisticated planning techniques. Um, and I don't have time to describe the details here, but um, in a paper that we also published last year at iClear, we developed a planning method called SAVE, um, which is kind of similar to how like alpha zero and mu zero work in that it has this sort of bootstrapping idea in it where you sort of, you know, you improve your policy or your value function, and then you use that to improve your original one. Um, and and so you can see here the um, curve in green corresponds to the results in these construction tasks that we get using save. And the pink curve is, is the results that I was just showing you before. And so we gave even more stable performance um, with larger numbers of simulations um, using this more sophisticated planning method. Um, Okay, but so the key takeaway here is that we can achieve compositionality by using representations that are structured in a way that in some way reflects the structure of the environment itself. Um, and that this is, is a really important way of structuring value functions as we used here. Um, but you can also do the same thing for policies and for models. Um, and I have some other work that explored using graph neural networks for models too. And so I think thinking about these types of representations that have some notion of compositionality embedded in them and then using those for all of these different components that we need in a model-based agent is a really powerful idea and I think is what we're gonna need in order to get towards this dream of having agents that can generalize well. So, okay, just to recap, in the talk I discussed how mental simulation works in humans, what it looks like in our deep learning agents and what some of the limitations are. Um, specifically, the limitations I discussed were that current approaches in model-based RL are not yet as compositional, incomplete, causal, adaptive, um, or, or adaptive as human mental simulations. Um, and on the compositionality side, I showed that the failures of model-based RL to generalize to new tasks is not just due to the failure of the models themselves to generalize, but also the policies and value functions which guide the planning process. And we can address this through structured models and policies like, like graph neural networks that can allow our agents to better learn about and exploit the structure of the world. Um, and in particular, as in what I showed here, it can enable them to learn better about how objects interact with one another and to acquire knowledge that generalizes better to things that it hasn't seen before, such as stacking twice as many blocks in the silhouette task. Um, of course, I think that this is only a step in the right direction and there's a lot more work that needs to be done until we can match the compositionality of human mental simulation in the general case. Um, and I also didn't talk about these other dimensions of incompleteness, causality, and adaptivity, but I think that there are some promising approaches in um, various works for dealing with these too. Um, for example, there's this you know, newer class of self-supervised or contrastive methods that could potentially help agents learn only the relevant features of a scene without needing to capture all of the details. And some of the other work that I've done looking at say object-oriented approaches to manipulating scenes um, and at meta-reasoning to decide how much computation to perform could provide a way to improve causality and adaptivity too.
but there's still quite a long ways to go before we have all of the answers. Um, but hopefully what I've discussed today at least gives a starting point for thinking about how to bring AI closer to the abilities of humans. So I just want to thank all of my collaborators and colleagues, and thank you very much for inviting me and for listening to my talk. Um, and I'll just, as a quick parting note, if you're interested in these construction tasks, they're available on GitHub at this link. And if you want to know more about some of these methods and model-based deep reinforcement learning, um, I had a, a tutorial at ICML last summer that sort of gives a very broad overview of the field. Um, so you could also check that out if you're interested. Thank you. Oh, it's unfortunate that you know we all can't just clap together to, you know, to make it really welcoming and everything. But thank you very much for sharing your insight and then also perfectly timed presentation. It's yeah, quite amazing thanks. that you know you hit the time perfectly. Uh, I do believe that there were a number of questions, but let me look at the one more question that was just posted. So I'll just read it out. So, mm -hmm. to what extent do you think the task you test for the graph model is compositionality tailored? Could you imagine a scenario where compositionality actually make the agent perform worse? So thinking about this some adversarial scenario for the compositionality aware agent, can you imagine something like that? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I suppose like if you're in a setting where like there's no sort of sensible like relation or there's no like sy systematicity and or like um, no correlations between like, you know, how things interact, like every object interacts in a different way with everything else. Like maybe trying to break it up into this compositional representation would actually be harmful there because you're giving it this inductive bias to expect that things should behave similarly, but actually they don't. Um, and so mm -hmm. I, I certainly think you probably could construct certain adversarial settings like that. I think it tends to be the case maybe not always, but often in naturalistic settings, I think it tends to be the case that you do see this type of compositionality in the real world. So, um, you know, perhaps it means that you would want to like have that as a default, but then allow agents to, you know, perhaps detect if they're in some sort of adversarial setting where that type of inductive bias doesn't quite make sense and then switch to a different type of representation or, or something along those lines. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's a good question. I have I actually actually haven't thought about yeah. it that much before, but um, I, I we want to think mm -hmm. about it some more. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's very interesting to think about. And then thanks for sharing your insight. So for the audience, the, this talk has been recorded and then will be available for you know later watching at the homepage of the short seminar as well as the on was it YouTube I think or one of them you know one of the video services so you'll be able to watch it over and over in order to get the best out of the <laughs> Jessica Hemrick's insights and Jessica thanks again for joining us and then that actually concludes today's seminar thank you very okay. much thank you very much